this is Steve and I'm here with Bob Thomas who is running for the third congressional district in Indiana for the house seat. Right. Uh, Bob, how are you today? I'm fine. How are you doing? Pretty good. Good. We appreciate your time. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. So you made an announcement uh -huh. uh, this week. Uh, what was your big announcement? Well, I made an announcement three months ago that I was running for Congress. I was I was one of the uh, of, of only the uh, what three people that were willing to take on the challenge of of running against an incumbent. But uh, yes, I want to be the congressman for the third district of Indiana. Mm -hmm. And we had the primary, and you finished the second, second. Mm -hmm. for the Republicans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got uh, I got the highest percentage of the people who voted for me. Uh, than anybody who didn't actually win a race. So, um, so uh, yeah, I was the I was the people's choice, except for the two guys that won both the Senate race and the House race. Mm -hmm. So now here we are. It's a special election. Uh, what do you see as the challenges for the third district right now? Well, the challenges for the third district are the same. Um, actually, the, the third district is probably a pretty good microcosm of the of the of the country. Uh, there's a, a big spread in the third district. You've got it's, uh, you've got a hev heavy agricultural influence on the third district. You've got a high tech influence, obviously, in cities like Fort Wayne and, and um, Warsaw. And then you've got a heavy manufacturing influence up in the Elkhart region and so forth with the RV industry. So, so what we're going through in the in the third district is exactly what the country as a whole is going through, and it's it's uh, it's economic problems. Um, it's the level of federal spending and the level of federal debt, probably the serious, mo most serious problem that are face that is facing us right now, and it's jobs. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you're going to have to deal with health care if you're elected? Oh, there's no question about that. The, uh, the this health care bill was uh, probably the single most disastrous to piece of legislation passed since uh, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. Um, it's going to have to be repealed. Otherwise, it's, it'll destroy health care as we know it. I mean, it'll really, really damage. Because there isn't a single facet of health care in the United States that this thing isn't going to hurt. It's going to hurt the doctors. It's going to hurt the hospitals. Uh, it's certainly going to hurt the, uh, the pharmaceutical companies. They're already there. And it's, and, and it's going to hurt anybody that makes anything for the medical industry, uh, the, medical, you know, the implements business that we have in Warsaw. Um, the research side of it, uh, it's just it's just a disaster. Mm -hmm. And what do you think that you bring to the table as far as qualifications? Well, um, I think it's pretty simple as to what's going on, you know, what we need to address here. Uh, the, the, the issues facing the federal government, facing the people of the United States are, are probably um, more serious now than they've ever been in the history of our country. The, uh, we have spent this country, not we, Congress and the President have spent this country into bankruptcy. We are bankrupt. There's no question about it. Letter, level of federal debt is rapidly going as high, uh, going to the to our entire GDP. That's perfect example of bankruptcy. We're going to hit a wall, and we need people in Washington D.C. who really do understand economics. They understand. Wall Street, they understand Main Street, they understand all of the issues that are facing these countries, they can, they can do the economic analysis. So it's going to take a different type of person than we've had in Washington, D.C. What we've had in Washington, D.C. for the last 50 years is either good guys, good old boys, that type of people that were nice and, you know, they wanted to go, we sent them to Washington, D.C. just because we liked them and so forth. Uh, or we've had, uh, and, and what they've turned out to be is professional career politicians, and they have no experience in what they're dealing with. Uh, they've been in Washington too long to really understand what's going on in, on Main Street, and they're being faced with problems that they can't handle. Um, when the Secretary of the Treasury, with his experience, you know, he was from Wall Street, we're talking about Henry Paulson, goes, goes in front of Congress and says he needs $700 billion to bail out Wall Street, and they give it to them, it's obvious that they don't understand what they're doing up there. Mm -hmm. Let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, won the primary, or you, you came in second mm -hmm. in the primary and thought maybe you were done, and all of a sudden, you know, not even a month later, mm -hmm. here we are, we are special again. election. <laughs> How is that going to affect your campaign, do you think? 
Well, uh, well, first of all, we have a caucus, so that's going to be a decision you know, to decide who will be the Republican candidate in both the general election and the special election that's coming up. Uh, and that's a different animal. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not talking to the voters anymore. We're talking to precinct committee people. Now, um, the disadvantage to that is we're not talking to the voters. So there are going to be a lot of people who saw me come in second and are thinking, well, the will of the voters is now being ignored because uh, he, he generated 35 percent of the vote and we're and now we have all these other people challenging who weren't in there. So, you know, why have the primary if you don't go to the second guy? On the other hand, uh, the precinct, you know, uh, and the problem that the Republican Party faces in that regard is that it's very easy for people to think, uh-oh, smoke-filled room, backroom deals, who's, who's slapping whose back, who owes, who's calling in chits and all that other stuff. So it, it could very easily look uh, just like uh, good old-fashioned backroom politics, politics as usual, and boy, if, uh, if, that's, uh, if there's a time in history when that's not going to resonate, it's right now. I mean, look at the Tea Party movement. I mean, they don't want just good old-fashioned politics. They want something a lot more transparent. On the other hand, uh, you would assume, and I assume, and I give them a lot of credit for this, that the, that the precinct committee people are going to take this seriously. They're going to look at the, at the candidates. They're not going uh, to make this a beauty pageant or a popularity contest. They're going to look at the credentials. They're going to look at who has the experience, who has the training, who has the, the, uh, the education to be able to face some of these issues. And if that's the case, then I'm going to come out on top because my education certainly is, is uh, good in that regard. And I've had 30 years of business experience right here on Main Street, right here in Fort Wayne. I've hired thousands of people. I've been creating jobs here for 30 years. None of the other candidates can say that. I've paid hundreds of millions of dollars of, of, of taxes and wages and personal property taxes, supported the schools. So I have a an enormous interest in the third district, and the third district has an enormous effect on me and my life and my, my family's life. So uh, I'm going to look pretty good from that perspective. Uh, they're going to want somebody who's serious. I've dealt with Ford execs, I've dealt with banks, I've dealt with unions, uh, I've, you know, I, I know how Wall Street and works, um, so I've got all the credentials to represent this, this district well in Congress. Whoever is decided upon, do you think that their chances for beating Tom Hayhurst in November, do you think those will be hurt by the Souter situation? Do you think? Uh, well, let me put it this way. Um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, Congressman Souter, obviously, what I complained about through the whole, the, through whole, the whole primary was career politicians. They think they're above the law. They think they live in a different environment. They, you know, they, they just don't take Main Street seriously. And boy, if, we have, if we're not experiencing a perfect example of that. Um, so if, in fact, the Republican Party picks somebody who is just like Mark Souter or has too many, too many uh, similarities to Mark Souter, some career politician, some budding you know, career politician wannabe, some, you know, uh, yeah, it could hurt very, it could hurt a lot in November. Tom Hayhurst is a serious candidate. If they go outside and they pick somebody who has no associations with the party, so to speak, no, none of this baggage, then it's not going to hurt them at all. Um, the, the voters are going to be looking for somebody that is not your traditional candidate, I think. Do you consider yourself to be that? Oh, absolutely. Not um, you know, never been in politics before. This, you know, most of everybody else, they've all been p politicians. They've been at the state house, uh, or or they've uh, or they've run for office their whole their whole lives. Uh, no, this is I'm doing this because somebody needs to go to Washington to clean up the mess. And I've been in business uh, for 30 years. I can take the time out to do it. I'm blessed with a good company. I'm blessed with a supportive family. Uh, so I can take the time out, go to Washington, spend a term, maybe two there, and uh, and try to make an, you know a difference, and then come home.